response. Okay, hi everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depends on where you are. Um, welcome to the East Asian Australasian Flyway Shopper Tracking Group webinar today. Uh, I'm Ginny Chen, hosting the webinar today. Um, so uh, I will make a very brief uh, introduction before the talks. So the Shopper Tracking Group of the East Asian Australasian Flyway is set up in the beginning of last year. And the aim is to facilitate exchange of ideas and techniques in tracking birds, shorebirds, and promote collaborations between researchers and also between researchers and uh, NGOs, and to garner support towards tracking studies and conservation of shorebirds in this flyway. So if you want to join the mailing list to know the newest updates and activities, uh, you can send an email to this email here. And uh, just a few remarks uh, about the presentations. So during a presentation, please, uh, everyone uh, be on mute so we don't have any background noise. And um, during the Q&A session, uh, you're very welcome to raise your hand and I will ask you to ask the question live and that will be the first priority and you can also uh, type your question in the chat and and i can also read out your question but those who raise their hands will definitely have the priority to ask their questions so um today uh, we are very happy to have uh, two speakers so first uh, we will have uh, Dr. Thomas Lamiris from the Royal Netherlands, Royal Netherlands Institute for Sea Research. And he will tell us about uh, shorebirds, uh, migratory shorebirds in the Arctic. So during the breeding season, are they mismatched? And does that matter? So Thomas, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks for coming. I uh, look forward. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Jenny, for this uh, invitation and uh, and very nice to, to be here this morning. At least for me, this morning. Um, yes, yeah, so today I want to to tell you uh, a story from the Arctic, um, um, mostly focusing on whether Arctic migratory birds are mismatched and whether that actually uh, matters in terms of uh, the populations. Um, so, um, many, many of you will know the Arctic as a place where uh, your birds leave off to in the spring. Um, and uh, this is a place which can have a serious consequence for the birds. For example, you have shown that for three species uh, between the departure of the Arctic and when they come back to the winter grounds in Australia, they suffer uh, uh, huge uh, reductions in survival. Um, or, for example, from this study on red knots, where uh, birds returning from the Arctic, juvenile birds, uh, are returning with increasingly uh, reduced body masses, especially in the years of early days of uh, snow melt. Uh, but these are all studies conducted on the winter grounds, and uh, basically view the Arctic as a sort of a, a black box. We don't, we're not sure what's happening there. We can only um, make the deduction for example based on satellite uh, data. Um, but, but um, and, and, and that's, that's why I'm going to take you to the Arctic to see what happens to the universe from actually uh, going up there. Uh, so Thomas, get it. yeah, I'm um, sorry, your mic has some echo. Oh, oh sorry, I don't, I don't know, know why that is. I'm not, not sure, sure if I can fix that. that. Um, one, One second. second. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll... Maybe just check which mic you are on. Like, there's a select a microphone at the button. This is better. Mm, can Can you talk a bit? Uh, yeah. yeah. So, um, I, I hope, hope this is better. Um. 
Yes, no? slightly better, yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. I, don't I don't know how, uh, how I would want to watch it. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll just continue, continue if, 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 if it gets, gets too bad, bad I'll try something else. else. Um, so, so I would, I would like, like to, uh, to take you to the art and then especially from a, from a perspective from another far away. Uh, most of you can get through examples from the barnacle bees migrated to Western Europe and the Northwest Russian market and uh, the moon spread on migrating to Northwest Africa and the Central Russian part uh, in the Italian peninsula. Um, and so a lot of these birds migrating to the Arctic are facing uh, increasingly uh, uh, an increasingly warm climate, and as a result, uh, springs are increasing early. And uh, usually, these birds aim to arrive and start nesting uh, on the Arctic breeding grounds uh, close to the onset of spring. The snow starts melting so that their chicks grow up uh, when food uh, abundance uh, or shorebirds, that is mostly uh, insects which emerge from soil after the snow is melted. So when food abundance is high, so they can grow quickly. Now, with climate warming, it is expected that the uh, can be this mismatch that I've got to So with the earlier springs, um, this food we get advanced, and we we can consider that many shorebirds and other arctic birds do not advance their time of reproduction as much. And as a result, the chicks grow up under uh, conditions with less food, which, which can have an impact their growth rates of the This hypothesis. Um, uh, consists of several parts, uh, which uh, I didn't want to discuss with you today. So the first part, uh, to know whether the birds are to monitor the birds and smash, knowing whether the food peaks are advancing in a warm climate, and whether the time of bird production is indeed not a warm climate. Uh, two other important assumptions are whether uh, to, to see whether that matters, or whether late actually have a lower fitness for the hatching chicks. And what is the fitness index are in fact noticeable at population level. So do these mismatches actually matter for the population of uh, Arctic mines or birds? So I would like you to, to, to discuss these, these assumptions with you in this presentation. Um, first of all, we see this case, very strong climate warming in the Arctic, and as a result, this is earlier and earlier onset of springs because the snow starts to melt early in recent years. And how does this impact uh, these, these food piece? Um, well, to, to really look at this, it's important to appreciate that food piece are very different for different species of the birds. So for uh, many types of shorebirds, it is insects uh, that they eat, and here it's mostly the quantity of the cows. However, for, uh, for waterfowl, so many, many species of geese and duck, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, these are forage plants, plants and uh, they, they are very, often very abundant, but, but the, the mostly the most significant factors are the quality of, the, of these forage plants. So the beak is actually the beak in, in food plant quality. So are these two beaks advanced? One, One of the first studies, studies that actually looked at this uh, was uh, by Andrew Tobin and Hans Beckman, and they looked for four years uh, or for multiple years at the relationship between climatic factors and, uh, and the peak R12. And they used that to predict the timing of food peak, uh, food peaks in the Arctic. And they saw that indeed, based on this, we would expect that these food peaks have indeed advanced over time. In another time series, uh, I'll have to invite the very idea of the, the, the first day of the grain fire appearance, which is an important grain for uh, many species of shorebird and central Russian Arctic. And then so that over the years, indeed, the first grain fire to appear, this is a strongly fast. However, if we look at a um, much longer uh, time series, so for example, starting there in the Greenland, um, we see that there is a huge uh, variation between years in, in the height of the food peak and the timing of the food peak, and there appears to be no uh, strong trends in, in advancement of this food peak. So 
it really depends uh, very much where you are and, and what species uh, you will be looking at. If we look at forest plants, we see also strong relationships, for example, between uh, the, the peak in quality as you see here and the day of snow melts. And given that the day of snow melts are advancing, we could expect indeed that pool be so also advancing. Um, however, also here for an, uh, on our side where we uh, repeat the, 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 the uh, snow peaks, we see a huge variation in the time of these two peaks between the years. So it's not a very clear picture whether these food peaks are actually advancing. So no. Well, are the birds uh, changing the time in the production? Uh, in, a, in a larger study, uh, there was also this in the last session that, um, that some species are indeed slowly advancing their time in breeding, but not as fast as the, as the, the, the time the onset of spring or the day of summer is advancing in these places. Um, we looked at the uh, different populations of red and found that there's no clear advances in the timing of nesting. Um, but then again, if you look at the particle of the experience in the center of Russian, we see strong boxes in the lake days. So again, here it also uh, differs a lot between species, and probably the species respond on local changes in food variability. So, then the question still has to apply this much. Are mismatches indeed increasing with the warm climate? Okay. Uh, Thomas, sorry. Yeah. Excuse me. Uh, I found out the problem. Um, maybe you can um, turn off the speaker of your computer. Uh -huh. Now, then you don't hear me. Um, but... Is this better? I can't hear myself. Or I can't hear you. But uh, put up your thumb if this is better. Uh, uh, no, it's, it's not. No. no. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, but I don't know the speaker, so I didn't hear anything. Yeah, I think it's because uh, when you share screen, um, you also share the computer sound, and somehow it's, yeah, one it has both or so. Yeah. Um, I could stop to share and try it again. Yeah, yeah. Let's try it again. Yeah, so now, now it should be sharing computer sound. So, mm. yeah, maybe it's a bit. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, otherwise, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah. let's see. see. Um, so, uh, Mish is introducing a colleague to me uh, together uh, with some colleagues. We looked at um, uh, the large data set to see whether the mismatch are uh, in fact increasing. increasing. And we found that especially the higher latitudes, so the Arctic. Um, at least for some species, there is an immediate increase in spinach. Um, and that's because the rate of uh, uh, change in food knowledge is changing faster than the rate of change in bird knowledge. However, we look specifically at, at shorebirds and, and, and these uh, here on the map on the right side. We see that there are only a few days that have been more than 10 years so where we actually can see where the genetic images are increasing with red dots, but only two bright red dots, which, which are two the only two studies where these uh, mismatches are indeed in increased. The other red dots, uh, there's no strong change. So there's not a lot of evidence that these mismatches are strongly increasing over time. Um, however, it's also important to, to Realize that uh, even while this are increasing, it's very important to know whether each mismatch has indeed an impact on on the fitness of animals. So whether uh, chicks hatching later in this respect also have a poor fitness. And uh, Michel also looked at this, and um, he would uh, consider that birds that are found in base with their food knowledge experience no fitness effect, while birds that uh, are not found Base would have stronger fitness And here you see that for a lot of species, we have no data, so white dots. Um, but also for the other species, so uh, the blue and the orange dots, there is really a mixture of things. So there's species that seem to suffer from fitness effects, uh, that don't. 
Um, so so it's, it's, it's a bit of a mix back here as well. well. However, However, if we look at some specific examples, so for the barn bees, for example, we see that in, in years of early snow melt, when the geese don't, don't change their main days um, enough so they don't match the first snow melt, which is the moment when the forage plants peak in quality. Um, this is also the years that the bustling is much lower. So there are neat examples of strong usage effects. And we also see the production growth rate, which is in the red line. You see so the chicks that hatch later, so the later red hatch, they also grow slower. Um, but now for some short words. So, uh, do later chicks need a lower fitness? We also look at it in red knots, and that's where I want to uh, look at it with a bit more focus. Um, so, here I'll share again. But now, now with the sound of my video on. So, so first, first I want to show you a small video on, uh, on the field work that we did uh, with the central production market on, uh, on the red knots. Yes. yes. Okay. okay. And, and there, there we are. are. So, so uh, we, we went we went back to the study site where, where um, uh, Russian researchers had uh, looked at the red knots already in the nineties um, for two, two years uh, to study again, again the, the phenology and growth of these uh, red knots to see if anything has changed and whether climate change and uh, uh, impact the mismatches here. here. Um, and um, uh, in, in 2008, 2008, the snow melt is relatively early, and as you can see here on this map, 
the phone in these couple of photos, it quickly disappears in the first day of June. Um, and that was much earlier than the 90s. And we started in 2018 uh, because this is really also the peak of insects, as you see here, was rather, rather early. Uh, especially also compared to 2019, but so much later, so the insect peak was later. If we compare it to the hatch of the, uh, the chicks, we see that in 2018, the chicks actually hatched after the peak, but in 2019, they hatched before the peak. And if we then look at the impacts on the, on the growth, we see here the chick growth in the 90s, in two years, it was very similar. In 2018, it was rather uh, quite a bit slower, and the 90s was again on par with the 90s. And if we then look at um, at the growth as a as a uh, relative to the day uh, to the hatch relative to snowmelt, we see that when chick hatch chicks hatch early relative to the day of snowmelt, they grow fast. If they hatch late relative to the day of so thirty days or after the day of so um, they grow much slower. So, and also same for uh, if you look at hatching relative to the speed day, unfortunately, yeah, over two years, we see the same pattern. So it indeed seems that they hatching chicks are growing uh, quite a bit slower than early hatching chicks. Um, and then we were also interested to see whether the same would be true for other populations of rat nuts. Also, um, uh, Papa Tungolch was able to share a great nuts in the server. So we could do this very nice comparison, very similar species, to see whether they would suffer similarly from hatching data. And this became a very nice global study, which we were able to compare between the within species. And we saw that the response is very between species that were worked up with new spread of which I just showed as well, is really that the early hatching chicks always got better. However, for some other species, such as the surfers here in green, or Islamic Islam here in yellow, uh, there seem to be a peak. So when you hatch close uh, to the east peak, then you grow fast. But if you, if you hatch either earlier or later, then you also grow uh, quite a bit poorer. Um, so, also here, there is variation from species. Um, so then we, we come to the final part. Are fitness impacts that are noticeable at population level? And here it's important to, to consider that um, uh, fitness is not only determined by, by the spirit of a chick growth, but also by how many adults uh, come to breed, to breeding for pregnancy, how many eggs do they lay, what is their incubation success? Uh, how, how much, much how do the juvenile survive, but also how do they survive after having fledged, etc. And only then, you know, some of the portion of juveniles, a measure which is often taken, for example, in geese, you see a brand geese with a couple of juveniles. Um, and then you, you, you might be able to, to tease apart the impacts of a mismatch population. However, this is only rarely done. Um, and I, I try to come a bit closer to this by taking a barn piece example. Uh, so, so for barn piece, we see that um, when, when chicks hatch later, later mismatch is a bit larger, uh, there's a small upgrade that goes down. down. Um, but, but if we look at some other aspects, we see that in, in years of really early with snow melt, uh, the clutch channel is actually larger and also the number of chicks that, that, that hatch the eggs, but there seems to be little impact on, on the hatching success. Yet yeah, another very important parameter that many don't consider is how many adults actually start incubating the nest. And this is what uh, my colleague uh, Phil Bob does. Um, and he found that he uh, had red and orange dots, which are incubated birds, um, the propensity of birds that actually start uh, a nest is much higher in the early spring than in the late spring. Here, you see the red dots, those are one of the spring, and I'll buy some, yeah, sample. Um, in the late spring, see, uh, almost none of these species actually start to breathe. So, if you take this all together, then does the mismatch still have an effect on the population? But for one population, we see that the population is only growing still. 
um, even while the object is warming up very rapidly in recent years. Yes, the number of uh, uh, a few thousand days they come back with the winter grounds seems to decrease already uh, since, um, since, the, since the 80s. So, um, how much, uh, how big the impact is here is still uh, to be. Uh, to be, uh, to be discovered because it's, it's, it's still difficult to tease apart. Um, but also, also in the short, short uh, other aspects may, may be important. Uh, this study by Yohuna uh, Riefenstahl uh, in Colossian Revolution uh, showed that for standard based uh, breeding on Greenland, um, the mismatch is increasing. Um, but it's not uh, the early. Uh, the early soundings that are best off because those have been estimated by Arctic foxes much more than soundings that started in this late. This is what we're going to here. Yeah. Um, but this is the study by Google Minions. Um, but but is, 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 it, is, it, is, it, is it that complicated always? So uh, it can be more complicated. And this is the study by Jan van Kils from Red Nuts, where you see that. Uh, in years with early snowmelts, juveniles come back with, uh, uh, with lower body mass, but, but also importantly, smaller bills. And this and can, can, affect, can, have actually can carry over effect to how, they do, how well they fare in, in the winter. So with shorter bills, they uh, are better able to, to eat less than uh, five pounds and are more dependent on seagrass in this case. Uh, but importantly, these shorter the bills you know, seem to have a much lower small pool. So in this case, uh, it appears that indeed a mismatch does have an impact uh, that goes much more further than just the impact at the, at the chick level, uh, but it could lead to impact population. So to conclude, um, there seems to be not too much evidence of food being actually found, but at least some resources of the grass quality crane, crane quality emerging seem to found in the stream. Many arch monitor birds do not show clear advance in the bottom of the plane. The hatching of the chicks and bees seems to suffer from reduction of growth as well as survival. Um, and um, there's actually many factors that may have been issued of mismatch of the population that have. Uh, but, but here, here we should be very much aware of area. Um, so, so while this, this may not have solved uh, uh, the question whether uh, whether it impacts um, uh, whether, whether the Arctic monitor birds are mismatched, whether it matters, and hopefully it brings you brings us a little bit closer to understanding the complexity of this, um, and then to actually start to understand the impacts of warm climate. It's very important that we uh, that, that we keep on monitoring in the Arctic, and uh, with that, I would like to uh, give a little attention also to to the, to the currently changing uh, situation in the Russian Arctic, especially um, where we currently are lacking a lot of monitoring because of, uh, of the ongoing war, uh, and that my, many, much of the work uh, that I've just shown you has in fact been. Uh, Brought together by collaboration with a lot of Russian scientists, which I uh, certainly want to thank you. And, um, and with that, I, I want to, uh, to finish off and thank you for, uh, for attending this. Oh, thanks a lot, Thomas, for a really nice talk. Um, so, uh, are there any questions? Um, I will also check. If there's something in the chat. Mm. So I don't see any questions yet. Um, so maybe I ask something. <laughs> So yeah, um, yeah. So actually, I wonder: um, is there a general difference in these trends between the uh, species of geese and shorebirds, like other like geese in general? 
Uh, yeah, that's a good question. And, and it's something that I'm, I'm rather interested in. Um, uh, in general, in, in terms of uh, population counts, you see that manatees are actually doing much better uh, yeah. at the population level than, than shorebirds. Um, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is because of differences in, in what's happening in the Arctic. Or differences into what's happening uh, along with their migratory routes. Um, mm -hmm. it, it does seem to be the case that there are definitely some, some species of bees that are benefited from early Arctic, uh, early springs in the Arctic. Springs, the Arctic. Um, and I think this is uh, this really different from the really good plants in maybe one of these, these factors of some tree to that. Um, but, but in fact, fact um, uh, this 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 might actually this might be a bit similar for shorebirds that are good in late in late springs. Um, also, many shorebirds may not be starting nest or nest or many nests fail, so we shouldn't forget that 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 especially these very late springs, which we had a lot more in the past, were not too beneficial for shorebirds either. So yes, I think there's definitely differences whether they are consistent. I would be I would not be sure. Hmm. Okay. Ah, thanks. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, so I don't see other questions. Um, so uh, yeah, I think we are, it's time to go to the next speaker. Yeah. Uh, so thanks, Thomas, again for really interesting talk. And um, yeah, so now uh, we will move on to the second speaker. Uh, Bing Ren Zhu from the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. And um, he will tell us something about the fantastic art of um, black tail godwit. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, oh, I'm very curious to what, um, to your talk, Zhu, um, about the black tail godwit. So the floor is yours. Yep. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, sorry, give me a second, I'll move this thing. Okay, thanks, uh, Jeannie, for inviting me to this talk. And also, it's great to see a lot of familiar faces in the audience. Uh, nice to see everyone. Uh, my name is Bing Ren Zhu. Um, I studied Godwitz. I found it very uh, fascinating to study uh, these species. They seem to be highly adaptive to their environments. And also you can see them from uh, inland freshwater wetlands to the coastal mudflat, salt works, they are everywhere. But do we really know them? I don't think so, at least uh, I, I wouldn't see that. They are still full of mysteries to me, at least uh, in Asia. So I started to study this uh, species in two, 2014 by comparing the, the morphology and the genetics I first realized uh, this, what we used to call Eastern black tail godwit, uh, actually contained two subpopulations, Bohai and uh, Melanoreides. As two subspecies, uh, to, de to develop this kind of uh, morphological and genetic differences, in general, uh, in theory, they should have some uh, uh, geographically separated. Uh, breeding areas, or they have some different breeding timings and so on. Therefore, uh, uh, but this kind of information uh, still in our flyway is still un unavailable. So to satisfy my own uh, curiosity and also uh, to contribute more knowledge about this species in our flyway, I started uh, this, this topic. So first I would like to uh, talk about this current distribution, uh, breeding distributions and the predicted run shift under climate change of these two subspecies. So here you can see this female godwit Q26. Uh, this was one of the Bohai godwit I was ranged and uh, cell attacked from this antenna you can see uh, during my PhD. And together with another 20 Bohai godwits, we discovered two 
of their breeding grounds in the far eastern Russia here and here. And also we discovered one wintering ground here in Thailand. However, uh, satellite tracking is often uh, limited by the sample size and the locations where the birds were uh, tagged. Thus potentially uh, could create some bias uh, of their true distribution. So in this case, in our Bohai Godwits, sightings of this Bohai-sized Godwit occurs in occur in uh, Korean Peninsula and uh, uh, many other many countries in Southeast Asia suggest that their actual distribution might uh, could be bigger than we have discovered in the satellite checking studies. So I started to think how to use this information I have, the studies I have already done, to get an educated guess of these two subspecies distribution, for, in, for instance, their breeding uh, distribution. Here I have the occurrence, uh, like let's say breeding records of these both subspecies. I have Bohai from my satellite birds, and also I have Melanoridis, thanks to uh, all of this colleagues, they've been collecting Molanoridis breeding samples in the eastern part of uh, Russia uh, uh, for many years. And also we can get all kinds of environment variables uh, from these open access uh, resources. For instance, this World Claim uh, website, uh, we can get the climate, climate uh, bioclimate variables, and we can also uh, have uh, habitat type uh, variables, and we can also get breeding season NDVIs from the, their breeding seasons. And also we, uh, we can get human activity uh, index. So with this uh, information, we could use modeling approach to predict, uh, to predict their distribution. For this purpose, I used species distribution modeling, uh, namely maxims. Based on our uh, knowledge about breeding Godwit's uh, habitat choices, uh, preferences, we prepared these 14 uh, environment variables for describing their, uh, the climatical and the environmental features of these two subspecies breeding grounds. Uh, just to give you a direct like, impression from these five highlighted uh, boxes, you can see these two uh, populations actually uh, live or breed in very different environments, right? You can see from here the annual the mean temperature and the precipitation and the human activity and the habitat types and even uh, the elevations. Uh, so we give all of these uh, variables to Maxent to this uh, distribution model, and then we ask it to predict the, the distribution range for this uh, species. And this is the prediction of the current breeding distribution of Bohai and Molanoides. We can see clearly uh, Bohai mainly breeds along the Arctic Circle in the Russian Far East with two. Uh, separated, isolated uh, breeding grounds, and that is cut, cut off, uh, separated by these mountain ranges. And whereas Manuridis uh, breed much to the uh, more to the south and below these mountain ranges, and they have this vast continuous breeding range uh, in Mongolia and uh, China and also Russia. We also calculated the habitat suitability, which you can see from this top uh, right corner. And with the brighter color means the, the highly suitable habitat. And we, uh, after we calculated the size of this suitable habitat, we realized that, wow, Bohai has such a small habitat range in comparison with Molanoridis. So, I wonder what confines this, uh, their breeding range. Why is that Bohai's breeding range is so small? So when we think about a breeding 
wader species such as black-tailed godwit. We know they're ground uh, nesting birds and they need open areas. And then let's look at this, look at this breeding habitat photos from, uh, from uh, their, their regions. For instance, here we have a typical Bohai Godwit breeding ground. You can see it's a very swampy area that is surrounded by the forest. Whereas this is a very typical Molanorides Godwit breeding ground in Mongolia and also in Inner Mongolia, you can see this vast open uh, uh, grassland with some uh, water like lake or rivers nearby. So then we realized that maybe it could be the openness of the breeding area that plays an in, in important role to, uh, to limit their distribution. So with this idea, we overlaid the boreal forest and also uh, known as taiga forest range to their distribution range. Then we, we can see Bohai Godwits actually breed in the middle of the, of the taiga forest and also between those mountains. Uh, whereas Molanuridis are in much wider and open areas in the south of the Bore, uh, boreal forest. So when we discovered this uh, latitudinal distributions of these two subspecies, a new question arose. Like previously, uh, Thomas also introduced this uh, Arctic, Arctic area is, is warming much faster than the, the rest of the planet uh, due to the climate change. In our case, Bohai breed in the uh, Arctic circle where the effect of global warming we think is also much stronger than in the temperate, temperate zone where Melanorides breed. So I ask, how will global warming affect their distribution in 50 years? I can ask this and uh, because there is evidence suggesting that in these two European Godwit subspecies, Estantica and Limosa, their capability of adopting to this warming uh, climate is not enough for them to stay in their, in their original breeding ranges. Therefore, we presume these two Asian Godwit subspecies, they will respond uh, to the climate change more or less to these two European relatives. To test this, we, uh, we again use the, this species distribution model. We have the occurrence records and we also have their current preferred breeding conditions. And then in this uh, uh, access, uh, in, in this uh, practice, we used uh, these climate change scenarios in 2070, which is in 50 years. And we use the two uh, carbon emission scenarios, which is RCP 4.5, in which greenhouse uh, gets emission, peaks around 2040 and then decline. And we also used RCP 8.5, which is a scenario that uh, uh, predict the carbon emission continues to grow until uh, throughout this century. And then lastly, we use these two globe, uh, global climate uh, model to predict the distribution. And this is how it looks like. And this, the model suggested that the habitat range uh, in 2070 for both subspecies under this both uh, carbon emission scenarios would be decreased dramatically as we can see from this original, like current distribution range to RCP 4.5 and all the way to 8.5. And not only the habitat range decreased, but also the habitat suitability uh, decreased also dramatically, as we can see from this uh, top right uh, corner. And both, uh, both subspecies would also shift northward for instance, here we can see Bohai originally from these areas, and then they would move to the Arctic coast. And the Molanoides, however, wouldn't shift the, their range too much, because you can see from here and here, and also the, uh, the, the latitude. But the model suggests that their breeding elevation, the Molanoides 
breathing elevation would be increased. Why is that? We think that's probably still because of the mountain ranges and the boreal forest. They would, these uh, geographical barriers would cut off the northward uh, expansion for these subspecies, subspecies. And for Monanuridis, they would need to make a nearly 2,000 kilometers jump from their current distribution range to the Viuyui and the Lena River Basin, which is around here, uh, to be able to reach Bohai's current breeding habitat. But by then, uh, in 50 years, the model predicts that the condition in this in these areas would be still too cold and dry for Melanoridis. So after this practice, basically we had an uh, impression of the breeding ranges of these two subspecies, and we also examined the impact of the climate change on the breeding ranges uh, for these two subspecies in the future. Right? When I look at the movement of uh, the satellite tracked Bohai godwits when they fly between their uh, breeding grounds and to their wintering grounds, I wonder, is this the only pattern of their migration? And do they only use, for instance, this part of the locations during their non-breeding seasons? And what about the Melanoridis, in which we have very little information about it? So with these questions, I started my, uh, uh, my second project. I, I started to explore their non-breeding distribution. So to answer my question, I was thinking, um, is there an economical, I mean, just not directly go and tax some birds, and also relatively reliable way to have a first guess of their non-breeding distribution. Uh, non distribution. So we have so many raining stations along this flyway. For instance, we can see uh, on this map. And, and uh, they must have caught some black dog weeds during their, during their raining uh, work. And also these two subspecies, Bohai and Molanuridis, are very different in body size. So maybe I can tell them apart from morphology. So with this idea, I started uh, uh, this, uh, this project. I started collecting data. First, I have uh, Bohai, uh, I have this uh, genetically tested uh, Bohai and the Molanoridis and also their measurements. So I can use this data set as a reference data. And also thanks uh, for the great effort that uh, this colleague, our colleagues from the ring uh, raining stations along the flyway. Uh, I've collected in total 994 measurements of the adult black dog goldwits. And then with these data sets, I could use a discriminant, a discriminant function analysis. So this method actually uh, is, I think a lot of you guys might already uh, used or heard about this. It is, uh, it was once widely used in a, in a species classification in our zoology world, but it was gradually replaced by more reliable molecular methods. Makes sense. But in this case, in our case, we know that all Godwit subspecies have sexual dimorphism and uh, this discriminant function analysis has been successfully uh, already used in uh, predicting Islandica black dog goldwits, uh, the sex of the, the Islandica goldwits. So we also know that the body size of the, of the different subspecies are much bigger, the difference are much bigger than between the sex. For instance, Bohai is the second largest uh, uh, in body size, well as Molanoridis is the smallest. Therefore, we have confidence to use this method to separate them. It is a very straightforward uh, approach. So first, we need to uh, select the parameters. Uh, for instance, here we use the view length and wind length because most of the ring stations uh, 
they only they only collected the bill lens and the wing lens. So that's also what we used for the for the reference data. And then with these uh, parameters, we can generate a discriminant function, something like this, a value times view and a value times wing. And then we also have to define a cutoff value to separate these two, two uh, populations. And then in the, in the end, we also need to validate the model. So for this, we cross validate the model with the testing set, and then we bootstrap uh, our reference data 50 times. And then we use this function to test the bootstrap uh, subsets to see uh, the accuracy. So this is a discriminant, uh, discriminant function we have developed here. And we defined a cut, cutoff value of 13, which has the highest power to separate these two groups. And uh, a bird that with a, a discriminant co coefficient greater than zero uh, is predicted to be a Bohai bird and vice versa. So our general model accuracy according to accuracy, uh, according to cross validation is 97.7. And when we apply this function to the bootstrap uh, subsamples, this function is 97% and 95.5% accurate in predicting Bohai and the minorities respectfully. I would say it's a quite good result. So, so now we can use this uh, function on the ring data to predict the non-breeding distributions. So this is the result. Our model predicted a large overlap um, of these two subspecies during their non-breeding seasons, where you can see like here. The, the, the thing here is very interesting. We have three uh, locations in Southeast Asia, namely uh, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. Uh, these three locations only reported to have uh, Molanoides, but these three locations are, are also uh, only have a very small sample size. So it, at this moment, it is still very difficult to say whether Bohai would, would also appear in, in these areas. And also to, to understand, uh, this figure a bit more. So every uh, pie chart is the, the total sample size of uh, these reading locations. And uh, you can see the different proportion means the different like, proportions of the different subspecies. And we found here uh, from the checking, from the, our previous checking work and also the breeding distribution modeling, we found that this is the Molanoides, the breeding range, but this is also Bohai's stopping site. So here in this study, uh, we also found a similar pattern. And also here, this Mapo uh, Nature Reserve in Hong Kong is what we, is what we find the northernmost wintering uh, site for Bohai. We also find some very interesting things in Kanchapka, Russia and uh, Australia, where uh, Bohai godwits are predicted. So basically uh, this part and this part also has also have Bohai godwits, but these two areas uh, were, were not in the distribution range that we discovered from our satellite, uh, satellite studies. So to validate this prediction, we start collecting photos from these two areas. We first uh, ask the local researchers and the bird watchers, photographers, and then we also check uh, on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and also uh, eBird. So we collect all of these photos and uh, we examine these photos uh, independently by two uh, examiners me and uh, my colleague, Catherine Leung. So we first masked these uh, locations, the, all the locations uh, were unknown. So we just check those photos and then we cross uh, validate our results. 
Uh, so we do this first to keep the bias rate low, right? And then we also, uh, we, we uh, two of us also have the most experience in the field to identify Bohai Godwit. So it turned out that uh, from these photos, from our examinations, we did find uh, a, a lot more Bohai Godwits in these regions, in Kanchapka and, uh, and Australia. And also many other locations where you can see on the map with these stars. So it further confirmed that these two populations have a very large overlap during their non-breeding seasons. So after this validation, we believe that this method, the, uh, the discriminant function we've developed could be a useful tool for the reading stations along our, uh, along our flyway where the laboratory access uh, quite often were limited. Okay, to recap, from our uh, sub species distribution model, we found that Bohai breed at a high latitude near rivers in swampy areas with low shrub coverage and low anthropogenic impact. And Mulanoridis breed at the low latitude, mainly in pasture areas close to lakes and with more human activities. And both subspecies are expected to suffer a large decline in suitable breeding habitats because of climate change. And also using uh, discriminant function analysis, we found that through, although the geographical and the ecological characteristics of these two subspecies breeding uh, dish habitats are consider considerably different, their non-breeding distribution overlaps largely. So in the end, I would like to uh, thank all of my co-authors and my supervisors who helped me to develop these two projects. And also I would like, I would like to give my special acknowledgements to the colleagues along the flyway in, uh, around these reading stations who shared their knowledge and the data on Black Tergolwitz. So that's all, that's my uh, work. Thanks for listening, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice talk. Um, I see already some questions uh, in the chat. And I see a hand raised actually. Uh, Thomas, you can ask your question, uh, please. Yes, thank you for a very nice uh, talk. I'm, maybe I missed it, but um, can you assure that there's absolutely no overlap in breeding range? Because I was thinking that this is this is potentially an area where very few ornithologists go in, in Russia, so that it might actually be an area where they might at least approach each other very closely. But maybe it's an unsuitable habitat that I might have missed in your talk. Sorry, Thomas, your 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 voice is very <laughs> echoey. I, I couldn't get uh, the, uh, the, the, the half part of it. <laughs> Sorry. OK. okay. I'll, I'll try, try to repeat, repeat by um, yes, slowly. slowly. Um, can, can you be sure that there's no overlap in the breeding range? Because this might be an area in Russia where there's very few ornithologists uh, visiting. I yes, I agree with you. I at this moment I am not sure. Uh, it is only. Uh, for instance, what I showed you uh, was just a modeling approach. And uh, for instance, there, there is this part in the, in the Chukotka areas. And also from the book, you show the Atlas of the Waders in the Arctic. Um, that part is totally unknown, right? I've also talked uh, to Pavel uh, personally. And uh, basically that area, I, I know there might be Melanoridis breeding there, which is, uh, could be a totally different habitat than the, these temperate breeders in this Mongolia, in the Mongolia part. But at this moment, I also don't have any data to, to prove that that part can also be used by uh, one subspecies or two subspecies. Species. Yeah, so a good question, but uh, 
I I'm really don't know. But also recently, I I, I read uh, actually a friend shared uh, an article about uh, barn swallows. So it could be also maybe they have some kind of overlapped breeding ranges in the uh, Arctic in the uh, Russian far east, far east, but the uh, the migration timing there and your routine can be quite different. So that might also help to separate uh, from their, like help separating these two subspecies. Thank Thanks. You. Yeah. Um, I see um, some question in the chat, so I will, oh. let's see. So, um, Pan Lei asked, can sample size, so locations of breeding points of the two subspecies affect the distribution model result? Yep, thank you. Uh, thank you, Shu Xiong. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is a good, uh, very valid question and uh, also quite often very crucial to, uh, to predict the, the breeding range or the, the distribution range so ideally, although this uh, distribution model uh, can handle small sample size, but clearly we know that uh, if you have a large uh, sample size, the accuracy of the prediction will be uh, much better. But there, there are also some mathematical ways to, to cope with this uh, small sample size. For instance, I consider my sample size not high, not big enough. I only have 41. Uh, look, uh, occurrence records from Molanoridis and I have 60 from Bohai. So for this, I uh, luckily I use this uh, also bootstrap uh, for this uh, distribution model to compensate this low sample size. So yeah, I, I think uh, that that can affect the distribution, uh, the prediction of the distribution. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Misha Jackson asked, uh, uh, she said, great talk. Um, she's curious why you think melanoroides would be found in Kamchatka? Uh, because it seems that it's very far north considering their breeding range. Yes. Thank you, Misha. Hi, Misha. I hope you enjoy Iceland. <laughs> yeah, uh, good question. And uh, this is actually like, as I showed you on the map and, uh, and the, the first uh, the start of the second chapter, I, I collected a lot of uh, raining data from different raining stations. One of which uh, is from Kanchapka Peninsula. It's, uh, I think I've, I've talked to Dimitri and uh, he shared this data with me. So this is exactly the point uh, just now Thomas uh, asked. So for this group of Malanoides or Bohai, uh, which stop, stopped in that part of the Russia, I don't know where, I mean, for Bohai, I know they might go to this uh, Eastern breeding range, breeding habitat to breed, but I simply just don't have any single uh, breeding records for this Malanoides. So at this moment, I don't know, maybe they breed, um, in the Chukotka area, maybe the they breed uh, between the uh, between the islands uh, on uh, between Alaska and uh, Russia. So, and also the part I think in general have uh, have have very little uh, human activities. So, simply at this moment, we uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, ah, oh, great. So, um, so there. Are uh, David said, a wonderful talk. If you need photos from Singapore, just let him know. Thank you, David. Thank you. And Yoshida uh, said, great talk. Ah, uh, cool. If you need uh, measurements from Japanese rain data, uh, you, if you can contact. Okay. Thank you, Yoshima. I will uh, directly give, my, give you my uh, email. If you can see, or you can just leave your email in the uh, message box so I can, I can talk to you later. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, yeah, great. 
Um, so if anyone still have a question, welcome to raise your hand uh, or type in the chat. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, maybe now I can ask a question. Um, so it seems from, um, from you have uh, satellite tracks of the Bohai uh, god race, right? Yes. Um, so do they uh, stop at the breeding range of the other subspecies during the migration? Yeah, yeah. So like I showed, it's, uh, it's quite interesting when I first uh, found it. So mm -hmm. uh, this group of Bohai got with I've tracked from Bohai Bay. So basically their movement is like when they leave, when they, when they leave Bohai Bay, they go northward. They first enter the breeding range of Melanoridis in, in Mongolia and the Mongolia, that whole region. And they stop, they stop for like uh, two weeks during the uh, 10, 10 days to two weeks during the northward migration. Then they carry on. But there, there is also the place for Melanoridis. So this, I found this first from the tracking results. And also when I was in the Mongolia, I saw this very large godwits with very pale plumage, and they stay there for a while. And then two weeks later, I don't see them anymore, but I see more uh, breeding, uh, smaller breeding godwits in that area. Yeah, this is uh, their strategy. So yes, I, it's interesting. So I wonder like what, why, why don't they uh, also breed there if they can actually reach these habitats? And like what kind of mechanisms is in place, do you think? Wow, a good question. <laughs> well, I think, I actually don't know, it's a good question. Um, yeah, good question. I, I don't know. <laughs> Is there some difference in timing or between the two? Uh, for that, yes, for sure. And uh, as we can see along the coast, so when you were uh, in the in the Chinese coast, you can see, for instance, when you start seeing this very colorful, uh, very bright, uh, small godwits in the southern China, uh, here in Bohai Bay where I worked, uh, th those big godwits have already left. So. I, I, I don't have the actual uh, data from Melanoridis to tell this, but I see a mismatch. So I feel like, uh, uh, for instance, Bohai is, uh, they, they migrate early in, in spring than uh, in Melanoridis. Okay. Yeah. Mm, that's, that's interesting. Like I, yeah, I wonder if, yeah, because you talk about the change in the scenario, change in the, with change in the climate, but it could also like be a possibility if they also shift a bit their breathing range in, in a way that what I kind of thought. So, so there's really very, it's really, curious what happens in the future and yeah yeah, yeah it would be very interesting to to see if this uh this prediction is uh, valid but uh apparently uh at this moment there i mean there were uh evidence suggesting that already they've seen this kind of uh, trends and mm -hmm. also and also I remember from uh young Frank hughes study they also found that uh more and more red knots in the uh, Arctic, they start to breed in a higher latitude. Maybe it's cooler. So, so for that, they, they can compensate to, for the warming climate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thank thanks. Sorry, interesting. I uh, saw, so, oh, I see a hand raised by Jesse Conklin. Yeah. Jesse, yes. please ask your question. Uh, hi, Drew. Um, I, I was just wondering in in your you know your process of uh, assigning subspecies to the historical data sets of the ringing stations around the uh, the flyway. I'm wondering how your discriminant analysis dealt with the sexual dimorphism. You didn't you didn't mention 
when you get an old record from a banding station, they might have sexed the bird. Did you did you use that or did you ignore it? Or how, how, do, how do you deal with the, the fact that bohai males will be very similar to Melanoretes females? Yes. Uh, thanks, Jesse. Um, so uh, indeed, uh, they have sexual dimorphism, but uh, this sexual uh, dimorphism differences are not that detectable from my reference data. For instance, I use this uh, more or less uh, 50 birds from Bohai uh, of both sex and also uh, 100 something birds from Melanoides. I just first ignored their sex. I, I do have all of the, the their genders text, test, but even if I ignored their, their sex, this model, this function can still separate these two subspecies oh, in this wow. like 97.7% and uh, uh, accuracy. So I find it quite good. So then I just, I just keep, uh, I just keep it with this way. Okay, I, that, that, that sounds good, but, but are, are you still com confident that a, a tiny portion of birds that are bohai that are de designated bohai in Kamchatka and Broom, for instance, are actually bohai, or they're just in the error range. Yes. So, so in this manuscript, I, I calculate uh, the error range, and uh, actually, these uh, numbers in comparison with the total total sampled birds are still higher than the error rate. So. So in that in that sense, I I I, I can say I can say that the uh, the predicted po uh, occurrence of Bohai uh, might be true, and but also I'm still very confident. I'm still not very confident for that. So that's why we also collected data uh, photos from those areas. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, Dimitri happened to have this uh, one bird in, in his hands. And he shared a photo with me, and uh, that one was predicted to be a bohai, and it was so much bigger than the rest of the birds he caught. So this one he barely holding his uh, feet in his one one hand, whereas the others were just tiny. And also, same thing happened in in uh, in Australia, especially in this northern part, Queensland, this bay, where I. Uh, from the photos we uh, we collected from the local researchers and bird watchers, they're they're quite massive those birds. <laughs> so so I think it's totally possible to to see uh, bohai in these areas. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Um. So let me check if there are other questions. Um. Yes. It's actually, there's another question still. So maybe this is the last one. Um, Irene asked, um, in her area of Godwish survey, she has a three that has been seen in breeding plumage during winter months. So, so they're in breeding summer color on November to January. In that's in in Manila Bay. No, actually, Turnus has an answer. <laughs> seems to be a few. So there seems to be a few individuals with uh, aberrant modes keeping yeah. breeding plumage in the non-breeding season. Thank you, Donas. Yeah, <laughs> I also find that not only in uh, uh, Black Dog Goldwitz, also in my hometown in China, uh, those uh, gauss, uh, brown-headed gauss, and here uh, black-headed gauss, sometimes all of a sudden in the middle of the winter, you see them wearing these uh, black masks. <laughs> so they're still having their uh, summer plumage. Yeah, I think it's just some uh, individual variations. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so there are the people um, responding also that they have seen seen something like that. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow.
Okay, so um, I think it's time uh, to close the webinar. So thanks again, um, Thomas and Bingran for really, really nice, interesting talks. Uh, very interesting research, uh, beautiful presentation, really nice maps. Uh, yeah. um, I hope uh, um, you all enjoy the talks and thanks everyone for joining the webinar. And yeah, so I hope to see you next time. Bye. Thanks a lot.